Hello and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. By joining a hangout, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today, we're going to be working on the Western Friend website. We've been uh, working on this project for about a year now. Hopefully, we're in the last um, stages. We're, we're working on writing scripts to migrate data from the Drupal site to Wagtail CMS. There's not just a button that'll do the migration for us, so we have to essentially um, transform the data a little bit, export it as CSV in this case, make some you know modifications and take the opportunity to do a little cleanup, and then write some management commands that will actually import the data since we're going between CMSs, I think that's going to be pretty par for the course. If you wanted to migrate, say, between Drupal, WordPress, or anything else, um, particularly in CMSs where you can define your own content model. If there's a, an existing content model, like a WordPress, where everything is uh, primarily around like blog pages or something like that, it might be easier for the software developers to write the migration scripts. But our Drupal model is very specific to this organization, and likewise the Wagtail CMS model is um, mirroring Drupal, although there are enough di um, differences that we sometimes need to um, do a little bit of mapping inside of the this handler, these handler scripts. So without further ado, let's continue working locally to migrate this data. For every content type on the Drupal site, we will have a corresponding importer method in the, or class, and these uh, so these importers are run, they're invoked via manage.py, and then by typing the name of the management command file, which is an Kind of a strange convention. I would think it would be more explicit here. Perhaps in the class definition for a command, you can define um, the command name. And basically, by for writing these internal APIs um, methods, the virtual methods, you can like the handler method. You Django knows where to hook into the your code and execute it in the proper order. So we can write help text, uh, transactions. Um, it seems like there should just be an option for uh, the name of the command. But it's very cool. It'll It's based on Python. Uh, <coughs> arg parse and you know, some internal things for importing text from the file system and operating system. And then Django's added a few conveniences on top. So essentially each command inherits from base command. We provide a little bit of help, help text. And since we're exporting the CSV, we'll have one argument that lets us specify the file path um, when we migrate this or deploy this on a live site, we'll probably be using HTTP paths. I'll have to, I'll have to um, think about how to handle that because we're kind of deploying in a Docker container and uh, I don't want to sort of fumble around with CSV files uh, over, you know, SFTP or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, I'll have to figure it out. but. Running it locally, we're just going to pass in the path of a file by argument and then open the file in memory and iterate over each row and essentially map the CSV columns uh, or data for each row to the um, Django ORM instance for the particular content type, creating a new instance and then Wagtail CMS has a hierarchical page, 
um, model or hierarchical content model. So every, well, pretty much most of the content you define is either going to be a, inheriting from this Wagtail page or they can just be custom uh, regular Django um, ORM classes as well that just map to a, a table in your database. Um, but the, using the Wagtail page model gives you a lot of benefits like auto-generating slugs, uh, having this revision and publication workflow, um, publication dates, uh, a number of uh, search indexing uh, just off the top of my head is what I can think of. Uh, we just have to put it in this content tree with the root and then all the other pages. And it kind of enforces a, in a way that your content is organized in a, in a logical manner. So in any case, I've been creating index pages where certain types of content will reside, kind of like a folder to contain a certain type of content. And so we'll grab the instance of the parent page and then add a child. Uh, so all the magazine issues live in the mag underneath the magazine index page. And you know we just tell the script that we're done. I'm not doing error handling in here, but th this is essentially the pattern we're going to follow. However, the content we're working on today is going to be more complicated. I, in the last session, got off on a little bit of a maintenance work. I needed to update some dependencies um, relating to our accounts because we were getting errors when I tried to invoke and test these. So first thing we'll do is just test this one I, I created the other day. I haven't tested it yet. But we have a CSV full of these magazine departments. And on the website, I'll kind of give you a idea of how those are being used. Uh, let's go on to, to one of the free issues. The cool thing about Western Friend is all the issues that are six months or older are free for the general public, going all the way back to 1929. It's crazy. Um, the whole archive is online. It's on the Internet Archive. Um, it's been keyword indexed, and um, I'll show you those in a, just a moment. But uh, the magazine departments essentially are kind of like not really – chapters, but they're departments that divide up magazines into kind of uh, related sections, and those cha um, chapters or departments are used in every magazine, so every magazine issue has an inward light um, department that has a, you know one or more articles in there, healing the world department, letters department, reviews department. So in a way, you could explore the Western Friend content, well, in many ways, but you know, by issue or by department, you can see all the articles published under Healing the World. Um, and that's kind of what we're designing as well. So we want to give multiple facets and ways for people to explore and enjoy uh, this content. Now, the Western Friend magazine only goes back to around 2014 in its, 2013, I guess, uh, in its current form. But the Deep Archive is where where the issues going back to 1929 are kept. Um, and that, at that point, it was called Friends Bulletin, and it was like just a bulletin uh, newsletter that people would receive, um, you know, printed off, a lot of little to no pictures. Uh, these have been graciously scanned and archived by the Internet Archive. It's a really cool service. In general, the Internet Archive is doing a lot of great things, including allowing just anybody to upload their archival media, video, audio, books, music, and old software. They even have emulators built right into the browser that'll let you play old Amiga software and stuff. It's crazy. So if you have a chance and you just want to go exploring some free culture, um, you know, check out the archive, inner archive. And if you're feeling sort of a generous or charitable, they are a nonprofit and are in it's really important they're in need of um, donations, I think, because they're serving a lot of content right now to people during this coronavirus pandemic. All right. So let's go ahead and test this importer out. And then we'll dig into a more complicated one. Essentially, the magazine consists of several components. You've got magazine issues, uh, which have several articles, and each uh, article is tagged with one, uh, I think just one department. 
but one or more authors. So we want to get all these, this sort of um, these related, and these are all stored in different tables now in our data model, with the foreign key relationships. So we want to kind of import all those and preserve the links. But all we have are CSV um, files. So we don't have like primary keys or something like that to link them up. We're going to have n newly generated primary keys. I think that's going to be where most of the challenge is going to reside. Although I can export the primary keys from Drupal, it's probably going to be unnecessary. So if I want to invoke this um, management command, firstly, I have the data in the directory below. Let me double check here. WF import data. So that's so that I don't have to keep bothering with it in um, having in my VS code. Although now I do have um, a git ignore containing. Hmm, no, it doesn't contain the data anymore. I mo removed that. So I think I'll just leave it as is. Um, so what we're going to do is just refer to this department CSV when I run this um, management command. So Python, manage pi, the name of the management command, which is import. Now let's just do, let me double check. While the server is running, that the kind of the tree skeleton is in place. So manage pi run server. Basically, everything you, you do to interact with Django, uh, you do with this run server command. Okay, now this is Django utils. Now, is this core Django? Having troubles with. Let me just double check where we're importing this from. Menus. Ah, Wagtail menus. Oh, dang. So the problem is I upgraded everything to the latest Wagtail, the latest, which uh, has support now for Django 3. Uh, in general, Python 2 is being deprecated. So what we're seeing here is some. Um, a little bit of fallout from that. Django utils in port six. So this is to actually just a changing file uh, module structure inside internally to Django, but I'm using this for Wagtail menus. So let me just double check the Wagtail menus project. Hey, what's up, shot mem? How are you doing? And I think that's probably the. Let's see if it's the official GitHub. Do you do any web development, or what brings you by the Python channel? Yeah, sure. I can help with uh, web development-related uh, questions, for example. Yeah, admittedly, I should have checked all my dependencies that they <laughs> whether they support Django 3, so that's OK. Mistake I'm Now the question becomes, should I? Deprecate this menus package. It's not essential at this point, but it is something um, that I've got um, that I have a purpose for including so that we can define custom menus. And I could write my own menus extension, to be honest. Shopmem wants to make an online web store. Okay, I have an answer. So uh, I just got to think of the name of it. Sailor, S-A-I-L-O-R, I think is what it's called. No, not Sailor Moon. S-A-E-L-O-R. L 
O R. That way you don't have to focus on too many e-commerce, like writing e-commerce store. You can just focus on building the store out. Honestly, um, we have some e-commerce fu uh, functionality here on this site with regards to orders, org management, um, displaying products, um, ha calculating shipping, processing payments. And it gets complicated quick, <laughs> especially if you're going to be sorting physical goods in multiple countries, dealing with taxes. Um, yeah, like multiple currencies, stuff like that. It is a non-trivial thing. It's going to uh, be surprising the amount of uh, details you'll encounter. Fortunately, our little shop is very simple. We're primarily shipping or exclusively shipping to people in the United States. We have basically flat rate shipping costs. We're not calculating based on weight, just the number of items. We're not letting people select their shipping provider. But if you do have some kind of more complicated use cases, uh, really don't reinvent the wheel unless you're doing it absolutely uh, for pedagogical reasons. I, then I guess I could see that. But even then, you'll learn a lot by looking at existing code base. Shop Mem says, I'm really new into this. Any tips on how I can get better uh, into web development? I had an internship in with an online web store. They made a site within a day. I heard things like Shopify. Have you? Yeah, I've heard of Shopify. So that's the thing. It's like, if you just want to make a store, use something off the shelf. Uh, if you want to make an open source web store uh, with Python and Django especially, use this, Sailor. And just focus on adding your products, pricing them, promoting them. You know, it's just Python and HTML pretty much. Now, granted, if you're and it's got a React front end. But it's, it supports GraphQL. It does a lot out of the box. I was kind of looking for some docs. Let's see, how's the stream doing? So we're not having pain with problems, sorry. Something's going on with their demo, perhaps. In any case, that's the recommendation. So what it shop member, what are your goals? Are you trying to learn web development? Do you want to create a shop to sell things? Because those are kind of going to take you on a little bit different paths. Well, then for that, I would just, um, if you want to make a shop uh, shop to sell, you would just use something ready-made. And it sounds like you probably don't even want to manage your own infrastructure. So, you, um, I mean, really just focus on your strengths. And if you're not a, really a coder, uh, and if you just wanted to literally build a shell to, uh, uh, shop to sell stuff, then... Um, and don't mind, you know, paying a monthly fee or maybe the shop taking a cut. I don't know how a lot of these work. Just use something, um, some existing service. Um, you can get managed. Uh, managed hosting for some of these. But uh, not for Sailor, apparently. Manage Magento. Magento's been a while around for a while, um, but again, yeah, because you even if you're just hosting an open source thing, you've got maintenance stuff to think about, and that's what one of the things we've learned here with um, this website. It's a trade-off, uh, but uh, we don't want to focus too much on keeping a server secure and all that stuff, running updates, and we'd like to focus mostly on just customizing the content management 
part of the thing, the wagtail part. Uh, so we were looking at like platform as a service options like Heroku. So you just got to figure out where you want to spend most of your time, or at least a you know a reasonable amount of your time. And if it's just managing products, then I would just honestly stay away from uh, these kind of more manual things. But dang, Wagtail menus does not support Django three. Probably have to deprecate this package as well. So basically, let me see if there's an issue for this. And also, let me check the um, the pulse. It's been around for a while. It's got a kind of a steady pulse. One core developer sort of tapering off comparatively to some of the more active periods of development and some kind of bump and run developers of which I am not one I don't see an issue for uh, uh, Django 3 support although I should be coming up because Wagtail 2.8 uh, came out a little while ago with Ah, they did. Somebody did report this. And it was merged and fixed. See what changed here. Oh, just they fixed the typo. <laughs> and then import. Yeah, so it looks like that was merged on February 5th, and there's been a release. When was the release? May 22nd. So I think what's going on here then looks like this is maybe going to be an, hopefully a non issue. But another problem is it seems like poetry is not. Uh, really doing a great job of automatically updating our dependencies. You're supposed to be able to run poetry, upgrade, or update. And you're supposed to do it all. Po poetry, upgrade. Poetry, update. It checks your dependencies, or resolves them. Model cluster request Wagtail 2.81. Oh, this is interesting. Brain tree, Django Crispy Forms, Wagtail Autocomplete, Wagtail Menus. To 3.01. All right, good. So somehow my virtual environment had uh, been hmm, reset. All right, poetry. I did test and I was able to run it yesterday. Uh, there was a deprecation warning, but that's still there. All right, cool. Shop map, did I answer your question all right? Did that seem like a reasonable response? I don't want to distract you or deter you, sorry, from um, pursuing web development, but it doesn't sound like that's what your main goal is. Essentially, we can log in, and I can s give you a s sort of a peek at how it looks. Wagtail, and I've, uh, Wagtail does a lot out of the box. It's really cool. It's like a WordPress for Django websites. Uh, I've already scaffolded it with some scaffolded a, a couple of basic um, nodes in our our uh, content hierarchy. They're called pages, but I have a bunch more that uh, that don't automatically scaffold. It's just the way 
it's a trade-off basically you don't define your content in code or you define content types and then some of these content types only have one instance like you only have one home page but you still define it as a class in your code but you can say there's only one instance of this class so I've, for example contact form you're only going to have one of those um, and these index pages likewise so what I just need to do here if we're going to import departments I need to make sure our department index page exists. So I think it's in our magazine department index page. So I just got to create that real quick. I will work on like a script that will automatically, a management command probably, that will automatically scaffold these kind of one-off um, contents. Save myself some time later. Yeah, no worries, shop uh, Ask me any questions you want. This is an AMA type stream. I like getting off topic or... It's nice to have some uh, interesting distractions from the code. I'm on here for about an hour and a half more before I do a code review, so there's plenty of time for lots of questions. And we're gonna review this code with the uh, editor of Western Friend, Mary Klein. All right, so I've created this departments page. The reason that is important is I needed to kind of get a uh, reference to it here in the code. And since there's only one instance of it, if you Check this out. If I go back to the welcome page, which I'm at there, and I add a child page, I can no longer add a magazine department index page because the model essentially doesn't let me add another one. Uh, I'm not going to jump to the code there. So I'm getting that here. And for each of those um, rows in the CSV, I'm kind of adding it as a child of this index page, which I just created. Very cool. So let's see if this works. I, it's essentially copy and paste code, so I'm always a little bit... Uh, questioning, uh, it's copy and pasting from code I wrote, but even then I copy and paste from other sources as well, you know, that's common, you stack overflow, tutorials, things like that, but every time you do that, there's some impedance, usually with like what you're trying to achieve and what the tutorial is demo demonstrating or the stack overflow answers, so you just gotta, or even the code you wrote before is gonna have impedance mismatch with what you're trying to achieve now, so you just have to <laughs> check everything really carefully and make sure you grok what's under what's going on makes you understand how the code's working uh, and not just paste it blindly because um, you won't know how to fix it you won't you know learn the key answers uh, shop meb says they'll try shopify yeah I think so that's probably a good one it's a really popular one uh, you know you might even do these com uh, comparison sites like uh, platform 2020, you know, like, because you're going to, you're probably going to be with it a while, and there's, you know, you don't want to just switch platforms all, arbitrarily all the time, especially if you start building out your product line and getting people linked in to your address and familiar with how your shop is um, organized and things like that. You know, even if, uh, there's this thing called WooCommerce in the WordPress um, ecosystem, but I'm not going to go too much into WordPress ecosystem. But uh, check out these like um, comparison sites. They'll give you some nuances that you might not cons be considering right now, like beyond just like the monthly price. But uh, for example, if there's uh, different commissions, if they handle international shipping rate calculations, if they handle tax calculations, things like that, you might not expect. But if you look at these comparison sites, then uh, they might go in a little more depth and in detail. But in any case. Um, Shopify is a good one, and with the so the question is t the, to put a site online, you have to buy a host, right? That's not the case here. If you're going to go with Shopify, it essentially is a host. Um, so they will host your shop for you. They write the software, they manage it. You just pay. You're always going to pay. So and please don't use a free e-commerce site, you, you'll have a worse experience. Just be willing to pay something. Um, even for web hosting, you're going to have to pay at least 10, usually about five uh, dollars a month at the minimum for like a digital open, digital ocean uh, droplet, which is a bare bones VPS, virtual private server, where you have to do manual configurations and things like that, um, which is not where you're going. So with Shopify, you'll be pay, paying at least 30 a month. Um, you'll get these features. And their next tier up is 80 bucks a month. 
So you just know that there's some like we're not using Heroku in this project because they do a similar thing like that. They have like a five or ten dollar a month range, and then they jump up really quick um, just for a little bit more value, in my opinion. So I'm not sure what the Heroku pricing people are thinking, but here's some examples. They're going to take a cut. They're going to charge you per transaction a flat rate and then a percentage-based fee. This is very common with payment processors. And these these rates are very, also very, uh, sorry, I don't know if reasonable is the right word. I think this is a form of artificial uh, of, of, um, taxation without representation in terms of um, them taking a proportion of the exchange between you and a third party. That's the form of taxation. If they were doing a flat rate service-based cost amelioration or something like that, then that's justifiable. But for them to say, well, you know, that's a thousand dollar stereo, so we're going to take, you know, this much, and that's a ten dollar. I'm sorry, but uh, you get the kind of points taxation without representation, in my opinion. And point of sale. So yeah, for Shopify, you will not need a host. And I don't want to do link spam in the chat, so let's not go ahead and keep posting that link. And I don't know anything about that specific site, and I don't know the best e-commerce site. That'll be something you'll have to determine by doing a little bit of research. Okay, so all right, here we go. delay there. I'm just learning how to sort of manage and moderate Twitch chat. And I don't want to have this be a spam hotel. Cool. All right, but I can't figure it out anyway. So here's what we're doing. We're running this command, this management command. Python manage by import um, do, 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 departments from a file located one level up from the WF import data departments.py 
CSV, sorry. Um, essentially, our department is just uh, CSV is one column, it's got a title column, and uh, right here. And that's about it. We're going to open it up, iterate over the Open the file, iterate over the rows. For each one, we're going to create a department, add it to the tree. Let's see if we get some errors. Ah, so unrecognized arguments. I need to prefix that with a dash dash file. All done. And there's some deprecation warnings coming out of Wagtail, but those are just warnings. Now if I go to Pages again, underneath the welcome page, we have this departments page. And now we see, I, I didn't show this before, but there was nothing here, and now they've all been imported. Uh, because you, I had just created the department page, so I hadn't created any content underneath of it. So that worked. So likewise, uh, we should be able to import issues. Now the, we're starting to get into a little bit more complicated content types. Issues have three primary fields, a title, publication date, and an internal, um, some internal metadata for Wagtail. Um, the date, so there's two, there's a physical publication date for the issue, and then there's the content publication date for Wagtail. So we're just mirroring the two, but I have to include both of those since issues are based on a Wagtail page model. The other thing that issues have is a cover image. We're going to handle that a little bit later, but I've got some code here that should more or less allow us to either access an image file from the disk, from the local drive, or via a network request, get it into memory as a binary. Binary file in memory. I don't know if it's a file at that point or something. Binary blob. Um, so we have, and then just create a new Wagtail image, which in turn takes um, a Django image file class, wraps it up with some other metadata for display. It'll be kind of cool. We'll get that to work later, hopefully. So I need to double check magazine issues, but I've got those. Locally, if I load LibreOffice, Libre calc. And we'll, geez, it starts off really small. Uh, it doesn't matter, but we're going to look for now. Open. friend issues CSV with the authors we've done a lot of work in cleaning and parsing and deduplicating it's been a several week task Mary's done a lot of work Mary Klein the editor of Western friend uh, she had to go through and fix names and all sorts of things I don't know the extent of it she said she spent many hours on it so we've got 44 issues going back to 2013 in the Western Friend collection as you can see, our CSV has three columns, the issue number, and for some reason we don't have PDF copies. I don't know what happened to the issues prior to number 42. It's kind of strange. Uh, we migrated to Drupal from w WordPress like six years ago. And prior to WordPress, it was like a static HTML site. Um, yeah, I don't know. We could probably, I'll ask Mary why. What happened to those first 40 or so issues? Let me, all right, so what we're going to do, though, let me check my mappings. Uh, it looks like I omitted a field. So now we're actually going to hop over to the model because our content model should not <laughs> drop data. We don't want to lose data. 
in the process of migration, unless we decide to. I think there might be some fields we intentionally drop. So you can see here's that magazine department index page that we create an instance of. And the cool feature is this max count. You can say there should only be one instance of this page. And there's some other stuff here for rendering the page context and stuff like that, where this is standard kind of Drupal wagtail-y stuff, where we're not going to get too deep into it right now. We're going to look for magazine issues in the outline. Magazine. Archive issues, the ones are going back to 1929. Uh, deep archive index is kind of confusing our naming conventions. We're not. But let's find magazine. Got okay, the magazine department. I'll just hop over there real quick. You can see a department, like most of these in the magazine section, inherits from the Wagtail page class. And you can define fields and editing panels on them. Wagtail page comes with the title field by default, and that's all we have for a magazine department. Magazine articles, which we'll deal with in a little bit, they have more fields, including the, the department, which is a foreign key field. And yeah, that's going to be where we're going to have a little bit more challenge, uh, including migrating blobs of HTML <laughs> and hoping it renders decently. I don't know. It's going to be, I think, going to be a little bit ugly. My intuition says that. So we're looking for magazine issue, archive issue, good grief. Um, here it is. Um, so here it is again. Magazine issue has some fields. So cover image is relating to Wagtail images um, feature and collection. And the Wagtail images give you some nice things like cropping and setting the um, point of interest. Um, you know, scaling, cr gen thumbnail generation. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool deal. So we've got a publication date and an issue number that are defined in the model. So I was just checking our content model that we have the issue number so that I can import this issue number from the CSV. Good to go. Don't have to add that. It's already there. So when I'm importing, so this department works. Check. When I'm importing the issues, though, I need to also the issue number. <laughs> so the issue number is this field on the magazine issue class and in our CSV row just to keep things consistent use the same names for the same thing across the board so when you're wiring up the blue wire goes to the blue wire and the red goes to the red I think that should be about it so publication date issue number and title publication date issue number and title good and make any changes we're gonna have 44 43 issues And uh, let me just double check. Now we need the index page, magazine index page. So we hop back over to Wagtail here. Now, this is kind of cool thing about Wagtail. It's got a hierarchical page model. Everything um, is mostly accessible here. I can drill down into different levels of the content here. <laughs> That's pretty cool. But you can also just define your own sort of custom menus and organizing things and organize things in a way that's intuitive for the end user it's kind of a bespoke organization so since this is i think first and foremost an online publication online magazine we have um, the three main components of magazine here accessible so i can jump straight to the departments here or if i want to check out the issues now here it's going to tell me no issues have been created and in order to do so, you need to create an index page. So this is the thing I was telling you about. Each sort of subsection of the website has a corresponding um, sort of folder, and I've been calling those index pages. And they're used for the URL hierarchy, the URL paths, and things like that because of the way the uh, Wagtail page model works. So in order to get a reference to magazine index page in our code, we have to actually create one. 
and that's either done in code, you can create instances of these, or for now I'm just going to go to the welcome page uh, and add a child page of that for magazine uh, index page. And I can only add one index uh, page for the magazine. You, know, you can see it's rendering some other field editing panels. We've got a rich text panel for intro text. Um, this page is one of our more complicated ones. We have different sections. In any case, we're showing a welcome, you know, describing the magazine itself, recent issues, uh, older issues, which we here we call archive issues, but really the archive is the stuff on Western, on uh, Internet Archive changed our semantics up a little bit. We call that the deep archive. And um, yeah, so you can kind of create these page layouts and let the editor ch modify the content without breaking the template or something like that. It's kind of cool. So now that we have a, a magazine index page, and I just called it magazine, we can add a child page and it, it knows that underneath the um, magazine index page there's only a couple page types we can put because you can actually define in your model um, parent and sub page types so that things are really organized exactly how you want them um, which some of our choices are subject to change you know these all go into separate tables uh, in your database there's uh, wagtail still has this hierarchical model I'm not sure how it works internally, to be honest, uh, but that's um, good enough. So if I go back to the welcome page, you can see I can add more page types here, but no longer can I add a magazine index page. I've already got one instance of that. Some of these other ones, you can add, you know, arbitrary number of magazine issues. There's no limit on that. Arbitrary number of blog posts if you're writing a blog um, content management system. But some of these you will add this max count property. All right, so I think this should now work. Let me just double jump if I change here. Oh, yeah, so I added that. Let's just test the, uh, well, I can commit it, but. Uh, it out, see if it works. I'm going to close the magazine um, related models. There's several models defined in this file. And now just list the contents of our import directory. List long format. My, con <laughs> my uh, sort of this terminal, the VS Code shell is doing weird stuff with the formatting. I don't know. Why? It might be I, I installed a bash extension or something. So I think it's WF content. WF import data, and this would be called issues.csv. Uh, well, then I didn't need to list it, to be honest. So this would be Python, manage pi, uh, import issues, and the file path is here. It's kind of weird, isn't it? So here it's going over each of the issues. We got a success message. We got this. Hmm. Uh, warning about time zone support. Dates are one of the hardest challenges in computer science, I suppose. What is there? <laughs> caching things. Naming things, caching, caching validation, and off by one errors uh, are the two hardest things. Uh, but then there's just date handling. Date parsing <laughs> has been biting us several times recently. And then um, time zone support is crazy. Uh, some of the things that come up when you start dealing with dates, dates and times and time zones. All right, but so that's just warning us that our internal representation of the 
date is more accurate than the CSV, which is just a string format. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't even have the day value. I'm actually just, it's got the year and month. This came right. So you, you'll encounter those things, types of things when you're doing data wrangling in general, but in the code, I'm just, um, you know, adding the first day of the month to make it a proper, so to speak, ISO 8601 date string. But we don't need that any more granularity than that. We certainly don't need the time component, and we don't really need the day component because it's just the magazine is published for the month. But okay, so it's published on the first day of the month is what we have resolved to do here. So now we can go over here to the um, magazine and index page. And if I list issues, you recall it said there were none before, but now there are some. And you can see the publication dates have been imported. So everything works with that script. Now this one I had written before and I knew it was going to work. And I copied and pasted this one to do the um, department's importer. But in any case, success. <laughs> now for the hard part. And I have one hour before my meeting with Mary. So I will I'll give it a, a, tr a shot. We'll probably spend 30 to 45 minutes on this task uh, before uh, either successful or have to stop for various reasons to prepare for the meeting and maybe out of frustration. And I haven't written this code yet, so I've got to figure it out. So if we go to a magazine, oh, sorry, we were already there, issues. I thought I could view the articles. No, but I view, let me think here. Well, if I go this way, magazine, issues. There's no child pages of any of these issues. If I add a child page, it's asking me to add a magazine article because that's the only content type that can reside underneath the magazine issue. So that's what, what we're going to be doing now is to import these rather than creating them, copying, pasting, some kind of tedious process. It's already challenging enough to do these data mappings and migrations, to be honest. But that's part of our part of our work as web developers. So yeah, this is gonna be the same signature, just a different content type, different uh, uh, fields and names for things. Import. Uh, actually, actually, I should, there's one more thing I mentioned earlier, the authors, I need to do those first. Before, essentially, when you add an issue, it has title, teaser, and body text. And this migrated body is for some raw HTML we're going to be getting out of uh, Drupal and just rendering out in its raw form. And hopefully, we'll evolve away from that blobby um, content model. I think uh, sort of uh, the trend in content management systems like uh, WordPress and Wagtail is to use more like a block-based approach where you uh, sort of store your content as in a structured format like JSON and each of the, it's like a, an array or list of um, kind of specific, um, well, the blocks, but sort of semantic or functional elements. So if you have an image, it'll be an image block and it'll have a spe like a specific template that renders an image with some alt text. Or if you have a video embed, you'll have a video embed block that handles the rendering of the video, um, things like that. So you can get pretty elaborate and have some very neat things like pull quotes um, that are very uh, sort of clumsy when you have um, the old, sort of, so to speak, the old paradigm of having these rich text editors where you paste everything in there and rely heavily on them to render it correctly. Then that may come back. I don't know how it's going to shake out, but right now. Um, we're trending towards this sort of JSON-based structure with functional component tree. 
So the reason I'm here though, just to briefly illustrate, that in order to add an article, I need to add authors and a department. These are those foreign key fields and tags. Surprises me, but uh, uh, I'm not logged in. So one moment, log in. So if I edit an article, I'm just going to check one real quick. So here you can see the blob, HTML blobby. Blobby blob body, and then a rich text renders on top of it. Rich text editor, CK editor, which is very nice, and they've done considerable work to make these like a word processor. Uh, and you can embed media inside of here, and even sometimes just copy and paste a link, and it knows how to do it. Like if it's a YouTube video, it knows to render it in a YouTube thing. But we didn't get into weird territory like to do poll quotes. Uh, we have to rely on specific pre-render plugins and this is a Drupal module and there's no equivalent in um, Wagtail really that uses these square brackets. WordPress uses these kind of things. They call them template slugs or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, essentially what I'm getting at those Dagnab it. All right, so that's probably not going to be a problem, but we're going to work on the authors right now. Uh, and this refers to an entity, like a, an actual row, an instance of a uh, data model in a database. And if I type comma and I start typing, it'll actually let me to select the correct entity from the list. And so we got this is also the case in our Wagtail website. So that you can't really make a mistake and that with these foreign key um, relationships you can do cool things like show me all the articles that this author published and in which issue they were published and things like that. You can start getting composite views of your data and letting people kind of explore or I want to know all the stuff about social action, right? More facets for exploration and discovery, organic discovery. So, And then search engines can optimize based on those types of things. You can add enriched metadata all sorts of cool stuff when you start getting your data really structured and it's just difficult to do when in a blobby content body. Uh, if we could put all of this information in just one body field, you know, the authors and everything, but it gets very tedious and inconsistent and error prone. So breaking it out, it makes sense. And now it's just the granularity is getting smaller where you're breaking out content of even the article into these modules. I'll just show you what I'm talking about in Wagtail called the stream field. It's pretty cool, pretty exciting. Stream field, so in a way, uh, you know, some of these are pretty low level things like headers, and people still probably misuse them um, to change the font size instead of actually using them as semantic and hierarchical elements, but that's another topic. But you can see they have more advanced ones like image that lets you choose to align it left or right, for example, or center maybe, or span an image across the whole thing, like a, a hero section maybe. Um, pull quotes, so, and it internally stores it as a, a like an arist, a, array or list um, with the keys and values based on the structure for each um, stream field type, and you can define your own types. And there's um, some pre existing collections. Let's just double check this. Yeah, so there's like people are publishing types, uh, stream field types. You know, if you want to put font awesome icons in there or display an SVG um, image maps, so not a geographic map necessarily, or they have ones with like. like bootstrap components or something like that, or displaying data in charts. It's really cool. What's going on with Wagtail and web development? Let's post this in there if anyone's interested in the chat, as well as Wagtail. I can't, hi I can't recommend this more highly. If you have a project you're considering developing and it's sort of content management 
related, which a lot of web projects are. Uh, start with Wagtail, it'll take you far. And you probably don't need a, a JavaScript front end, even though Wagtail um, admin UI uses uh, a JavaScript front end here. All right, so let's take a look at our authors table. So if I open, now I have to think here because we've been doing a lot of work on this authors table. I need to make sure I get the latest uh, and greatest. I think I just need to download. We're using this cool kind of Dropbox and Google Calendar and uh, a whole bunch of things alternative called Nextcloud. It's got built-in chat and video conferencing and file sharing and calendar and Kanban like Trello. It started off as like a Dropbox replacement called OwnCloud and then they got forked. There's some um, politics involved with the history of the project, but uh, I think Nextcloud is the kind of uh, a little bit came out triumphant, so to speak, the good guy, so to speak. It's just basically the kind of recommended way to use this project, the latest version with the latest changes. It's got a lot of other modules you can enable. But we're, so we're using it, including real-time editing of documents, like word processor documents and spreadsheet documents. So in our data migration folder, we have this process that's been going on for a while. Somehow, we have copies of copies of copies of files being created. <laughs> but this one I think Mary created a few days ago. And now we're using sort of a revisioning convention to at least add the time stamp there. Authors clean dedupe. So first we parsed them, and I don't know, a whole bunch of steps were involved. And this is not unique to our project. Just when you're migrating data, doing data uh, cleaning and deduping, there's some. It's a specialized task, and there's a lot of lessons we learned. And yeah, I'm not to say that I'm expert at that, but I've done enough of it to know it's got pain points. So let's just take a look at it. Open this one. Oh my goodness. Oh, whew. I thought it only had five rows. All right, this is a huge one. 2,000 rows, because this is all the people who've ever sort of contributed to the Western Friend magazine or the Friends Bulletin. So all the way back to 1929, and there's multiple articles written in each of these newsletters or magazine publications, depending on which era we were referring to. Um, but what we've got here, and I'll just start on the left column. Drupal, we basically put everything in the same bucket. Uh, all of the authors went into this, what's called a taxonomy in Drupal. And they're basically just strings of characters. There's no first or last name here. We have to first parse these out into given and family name. Another nuance is that not all of them are um, like a person. Well, let's just go to the left or right. Then not all the parsing is good because although my script, my Python script does parse William Magic correctly, um, Mary overrode that decision as part of her review process and wanted to put his middle initial there. So that's cool. We got that handled and you know Mary can choose which ones of those. That's a case we're gonna have to handle in the code. Another case we'll have to handle is some of these authors are organizations rather than an individual person. And there's organiza both organization and these Quaker meetings. Um, so essentially, my script is going to kind of go from right to left on each. It's going to iterate over each row, um, check if it's got a value in the meeting name column. If so, it'll create a new meeting entity. 
uh, else it'll check if there's a value in an organization meeting uh, name column, like create an organization entity. Then it'll check if there's values in corrected and given and family name, probably both. I think so in some cases though, there won't be a, there won't be one in both. Yeah, right here, example. So we will just use an or there. Yeah, and that'll allow the script to use the proper name for the proper field of a person entity. And then the last case, the sort of catch-all, will be to use the um, given name and family name that was automatically parsed just using um, string exploding, um, splitting the string on um, the last white space. Because you can see there's sometimes multiple white spaces here very rudimentary way of doing it, but it gets you a long way. You can see it handled majority of cases. Uh, all of this code is open source, so if you're having data migration problems, uh, certainly feel free to um, make sure that this parsing function is published. But uh, yeah, do check out our code and feel free to use it. So this one worked. Yeah, I'll just check. A uh, quick look at how our um, content is modeled so you get an example. Everybody now in the newer content framework have been kind of categorized as contact, people who have come into contact with the organization and, and usually an uh, author role by authoring some content. But we know that there's those different types of contacts and we want to distinguish them both for internal use to have good semantics as well as perhaps in the, the way we display those. So I, here you can see I need a, a few index pages real quick. So let's go back here to the uh, pages welcome. And this I have to so I have to create a couple boilerplate ones here. And you can start to see this is an example of a place where we're using the stream field and we've defined some custom blocks. And this community page has a really interesting layout and function. It serves as a, a jumping off point to explore events and regional and local gatherings, as well as connect with people online, which is increasingly important, especially in these times. A lot of people are meeting online uh, for worship and fellowship and community organization. So to replicate this sort of a layout, but not um, kind of um, pollute the content manager's vision with like block dragging and dropping and stuff, um, we essentially use these basic types of blocks, generic ones that you can have. For example, a, a heading and some text and images. That's um, what we call a card. Or, yeah, these are basically bootstraps up, but that's also as for another session. But here's an example, just so you can see. Actually, let's just do one like that. Come on. So we'll delete that. It will add a block. Uh, this can be a card. This is a button. You can, the blocks can have substructure. You can have blocks within blocks. Within blocks is crazy. You can nest them. You can uh, they, these fields. They're first class fields. So you have actual wagtail imaging uh, image embedded here with alignment options. And I've created this in the code. Um, introductory text. I'm just gonna create a basic one with rich text formatting, so it'll preserve the highlights, the italics, and stuff. And you can have buttons, call to action button with links to internal and external pages. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, you can do wagtail. It's just really blowing my mind with. Uh, how powerful and flexible it is. Let's just view this community page real quick. So now you can see it renders in our normal template. It's got the page title and this one block that I've added. So, and with this, the template knows where to render the stuff. It's defined in code, and uh, the editor's focus is on the content. So we need, the reason I added the community page, just doing a quick time check, is that now I can go to the community page and add a child page. 
we need three child children of the community page for meetings, organizations, and people. They're kind of like folders, basically, that hold the content in um, sort of a clear, clearly, uh, clear structure, I guess. There's only one instance of these index pages again, so you can see that they're disappearing as I add them. Oh, sorry, they're disappearing from this list. And they're appearing in here as actual instances of the content. And we have online worship and community directory, which we'll come back to. And all of these I should just scaffold out all of the one off things so that when we start up the project, you can run a command and have all your basic pages in place. But now that what that allows us to do is go here to contacts and start adding people, organizations, and meetings. And the content types have their own substructure, given name and family name for a person, a title for an organization with description of website, I'm sorry, a meeting and a meeting type. You know, so you can display, you can have a meeting page with links to the meeting and and use that as a reference on an article saying that this meeting also authored this article. Organizations similarly have a website in the description but no meeting type because that's not relevant. So all this was just to demonstrate what we're going to have to do in our code to distinguish the three cases and parse them into the right bucket. But the data has been prepared should be good to go. I just need to take a quick break and a time check. Probably about 30 more minutes before I need to segue in, in the stream and segue over to my meeting with Mary today. So I'm going to just take a quick bio break and we'll go into some Python. Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you in just a minute. Thanks for sticking with me. I just realized that I've got the wrong link. The link's to the wrong project here. So it might have been confusing if you're trying to access the um, project source code. You would pretty much want to jump over here. I'll just link here because there's a couple other projects you might be uh, able to derive some insight from in your own for your own use. So now we have the updated project. I, I kind of need a pre-flight checklist, it seems, before I start the, um, the stream. There's like at least 10 minutes of setup that you got to kind of make sure everything's working correctly. Video and all sorts of things can 
be buggy and I've had to reinstall OBS recently and lost my previous scene so I'll need to work on improving the scene configuration and stuff but it's interesting it's fun to do for sure so yeah we're gonna import the authors and I'll use this code which I've already copied but I'm gonna just make sure it's there and first we'll start with our imports so the community app has the imports um, for those three um, contact types. No, sorry, not the community, the contact app has these models defined here. And I probably should have defined maybe a, um, a base model, which they can all three inherit from. I think that will actually be useful. Mm, and I also, and because you can sort of search uh, via inherited models so technically I can find all of the organizations by searching from this page parent class <laughs> it's as long as it has the field I'm searching by in which case one bit of metadata we're gonna have to preserve from the migration is this Drupal full name this is unique across all these table all, all these rows we've, we've verified that multiple times now so Aesop has just a family name. But in case, uh, so yeah, I think everybody at least has a family name, but, but not a good, given name. I, there may be somebody in here with a given name, but no family name. So this Drupal full name is the string that comes straight out of Drupal with no leading or trailing white space. And it's going to be used as our sort of a unique key. when we're importing the articles because authors can uh, have contributed to multiple articles. So in order to do that, I need to also define that field on our data model and which brings me back to the inheritance thing. If you um, have a parent class and it inherits certain fields, so I could have a parent class of all three of these, organization, uh, person, and meeting, that has this Drupal full name um, field and then the custom fields. I'm not going to go too much into the inheritance thing, but yeah, I'm just learning how, how to do this Django and Wagtail development over the last year or so. And it's, there's quite a lot of cool stuff. And uh, really, I think it teaches some great software development patterns and great architecture. Um, it has really rich documentation and really nice uh, development and active development community. So I highly recommend just getting involved with the Wagtail project and uh, Django um, uh, underneath. Uh, so I'll just repeat this field three times. We're going to add a migration here. This is something that comes straight out of Django. Um, because what we need to do is import all the authors and split out the data into the correct fields, right? Given name, family name, or just title in the case of organizations and meetings, which are, comes from the Wagtail model. But then I need to also be able to refer to the exact entity after importing it while importing the, auth, uh, the articles so that I can make that foreign key link. And if I just store the parsed data, I don't have really a... Um, Essentially, I, I would have the same kind of logic to check it first. It's a no, no, sorry. I would have to have this uh, spreadsheet in memory and refer to the rows of it. If I just um, stored this Drupal full name, I can do a database query. Give me the instance that has this Drupal full name. Um, the trick being uh, they're in separate tables, which brings me back to the inheritance thing. It might be a good idea. Dang. <laughs> I guess I have to figure out this as I go. It's not a <laughs> trivial endeavor. I can say, give me the page that has the title Pacific Yearly Meeting. Hmm. I think I'm going to 
to write a little bit of code, but this just needs to get us over the fence. It's not going to be super elegant. Um, Hey, what's up? How do you say that? Voimar? V O is the J pronounced? Or a y? Say and thanks for the affirmation. I don't have to be elegant here. All right, thank you very much. That's probably premature. So I can just write some kludgy code. <laughs> I appreciate that advice. If it, you know, I do want to be able to make sense of the code when I come back to it later. And if it's something I'll be sort of building on and coming back to a lot, revisiting a lot, certainly it would be better to uh, think about. Uh, a clean approach to writing it. But yeah, this is just migration code, so thanks for giving me the affirmation there <laughs> to move forward. So here's a little bit of code duplication we're going to do. I'll migrate the field in, and then later after the website's been migrated, I can probably just migrate the field right back out. And let's go search a Drupal full name to match the um, table column and equals from the Django models. Um, it's just going to be a character field right here. And the max length is the only required property of the character field. But you can see there's several fields. And by default, it's not indexed. This one might be good because I'm going to be looking this up a lot. There's over 2,000 authors. And there's. Um, One, one article has one or more authors, so I think there's more uh, but one author can art, uh, author more than one article. Did I just say that? So there's a many-to-many -many relationship, but I'm, I don't know the order of magnitude of them. Uh, I think I can check that, though. Right. Look at the data. Hey, what's up, Imperium42? Welcome. Ooh, website. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to improve my stream so I can get the chat on, um, on the screen so I don't have to repeat what everybody says. I, I like to include... Um, the community in the chat. It's interactive that way. Let me just double check the article CSV. How many rows it is. It doesn't really matter. But I'm just now curious. It's much bigger. I wish it would just give me a row count here. But, uh, okay. This might slow down with the stream and everything. And loading huge CSV into memory. Well, not too bad. Mm. Is it churning, chugging? You had that before. What happened? Um, some weird thing. It, how's the stream doing, by the way? Let me know if it's having troubles like memory-wise. My OBS configuration got borked, got messed up. Oh, man, I wasn't paying attention. So there's fewer articles than authors. But in any case, if you've done work with data and queries and stuff like that, um, you know that indexing helps <laughs> in particular when you're trying to look things up fast and frequently so the whole question is whether I should add indexes to the to the Drupal um, or uh, author name column stream is good excellent uh, because what we have here is the whole article content goodness I'm gonna have to do this one Upstream, we've got a department, we've got authors, and you can see a lot of times they have one author, but sometimes they have a couple authors. And I'll have to iterate over these rows, and for each row, create an article with the title, associate it with each of the authors, associate it with the department, and I think these are the keywords, associated with the keywords. So it's going to be an interesting challenge, and I'm not going to be able to get to it today. So yeah, I'm going to add an index to this to this Drupal full name column. Max length is the required property. All right, then we will kind of rinse and repeat. I think uh, I don't need to really define any of these other. The defaults are reasonable. 
but we want to add this to the meeting. Where are we at? All right, so meeting, the person. Organization. I don't know. Do you alphabetize your classes when you have multiple classes in the same file? Or sometimes with functions, you know, you have to define the function before use. In which JavaScript you don't because of hoisting. What classes you? These are each individual. You're not. Uh, yeah. You don't have to define it before use or anything like that. I probably should just alphabetize it. Let's see, Imperium was gifted seven out of their eight subscriptions, so now I have a bunch of emotes. Very cool. <laughs> I was curious about those. I haven't seen those ones before. So with a subscription, do you get em different emotes for different streams, or how does that work? It's kind of interesting. So now we've added fields to the three models. I'm going to make a migration. Let me see if we're running over here it is so stop the project the migrations are going to detect that I need to set null as true because these fields should be nullable so I can be lazy <laughs> submitted without the field. I think that's what that does. Whatever. Right. All right, so still getting these warnings um, from Wagtail, but they're not a big deal. It's an upcoming deprecation for Wagtail 2.9, internal thing. Um, but you can see I added three fields to three different models and um, Drupal created migrations, all in one file handling this one sort of transaction, I guess. I don't know if it's going to do all in one transaction. I, I don't know how it works underneath the hood, but there we go. Now we're going to migrate it. So our local database will have the new structure. And I'll commit those changes here. different emotes, different channels have different emotes, and I can make mine code base. That's pretty cool. I should have a Python and a Django pony. What else? A wagtail, of course. I'll have a whole menagerie. Is that almost sounds like a, <laughs> a euphemism or something? No, no. But uh, okay, it's another French word. Sounds like menagerie. Menagerie? from Brooklyn. That's a good idea, Imperium. Any advice on, on this Twitch stream configuration and ideas is, is welcome. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing, pretty much. I'm learning as I go. If I couldn't figure out how to delete a message from the channel earlier. This um, participant came in, and they had some interesting questions, but they kept posting this website over and over, and it was starting to feel like they were spamming the website a little bit. I don't know what value they have derived. They were asking me how they could build a website like that one, but they posted the link over and over, and I kind of just wanted to delete the at least a couple of the links. I enabled a Twitter bot, by the way, not Twitter, but a Twitch bot the other day that's supposed to handle those links um, and purge the post, but it purges like all of the messages from the poster, and I, that's really heavy-handed. I'm using stream elements, so if there's another 
integration I could be using to, to auto moderate some of this stuff. I could consider it if there's something better than the stream elements. I don't know the merits of these other ones. Adding emojis is a good idea. I don't know how to do that. I'd like to improve the stream though, make it more interactive and you know prevent spam, make, keep it family friendly, stuff like that. I don't even know how to delete a message. And my OBS configuration got torched, so I have to <laughs> start yeah, learning pains. Voimar. By the way, am I pronouncing your name correct? Voimar. V O J. Are there any major advantages to using Twitch? I thought Code Buddies website has its own system. Yeah, Code Buddies is using um, this really cool project for uh, kind of online collaboration. What is it called? Gosh, I'm having a hard time naming, naming it. Jitsi, Jitsi Meet. Um, yeah, Jitsi is a really good option too. And even Jitsi has like a function to stream it. It streams it to Twitter, uh, <laughs> gosh, YouTube, uh, which is kind of cool. And it's definitely more hangout oriented because then everybody's a participant and can talk. A couple of things that I've noticed about Jitsi is um, it's kind of a bandwidth hog. And usually, because we've been using it just for regular meetings and um, I don't know that it's any fault of Jitsi necessarily, but it has to multicast. If you're using Firefox, it has this, uh, it can't multicast. It in fact has to create a stream, a media stream for each participant in the chat until Firefox implements multicasting for um, WebRTC. And typically we just end up turning off the video in Jitsi Meet so that people's computers don't kind of choke. So I hope that really gets resolved. I don't know if it's a browser thing or WebRTC thing or if it's the way Jitsi's implemented it. Um, so the other thing is like, I guess Twitch, so it's more optimized. Um, I like that it records the video and then I can synchronize it up on YouTube. But yeah, it's definitely Boimar. It's uh, something I've considered. And if I could use Jitsi and somehow broadcast out to Twitch, I think the point also is to build more community around Code Buddies. So by participating in places where people are already gathering, we're making friends, we're broadening the community. If I just used the Code Buddies platform and the uh, integrated Jitsi Meet, it wouldn't have the same uh, outreach impact. So all these are things. And of course, I like to build my own stream as well. So I want to acknowledge uh, that's part of the appeal of Twitch. But I again, just want the content to get out there. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a little bit long-winded answer, but... Uh, <laughs> I've thought about it a little bit and tried various approaches. All right, so now we're going to not be importing from the magazine. We're going to be importing from contacts, contact models. We're going to import the three contact types. Three important authors here. <laughs> Do you ever use uh, Voimar? Do you ever use um, Jitsi Meet? What's your What's your take on it? I've also tried a, few, a couple of these other, um, you know, open source video conferencing things. I think there's a lot of potential, particularly just giving somebody a link and they can click it and then you're chatting. You know, no registration, no app downloads. It does have an app download if you want to have a little bit more optimal experience, but uh, you know, the privacy issues. Uh, I don't know if they're doing end-to-end -end encryption yet. Also, have you checked out Matrix? Matrix.org um, by a riot, I am. Matrix is a federated kind of Slack alternative, I would, I would call it, in a way. It, it gives people group chats, private messages, and it's fully open source and integrates with some other cool stuff. Uh, including Jitsi Meet. They're using Jitsi Meet as their um, real-time uh, integrated video and voice chat. I hope this takes off. Uh, they do have apps, but it also runs in the browser. And uh, yeah, I just think we need these alternatives. Um, you know, the Nextcloud talk is also really good, but it's not something I could use for this stream. These are all things that are on my radar, though, and I've, I've considered them to various degrees. Oh, Voimar had to register with Twitch to write messages. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, uh, I don't know that I can get around that. Any of these, um, yeah, well, Jitsi Me, you wouldn't. You can just say who you are and start typing. Yeah, I, no, I understand that An anonymity is important, too, and simplicity is really important. 
in trade-offs, but I hope the registration wasn't too much of a trade-off. At least you could watch it without registering. But thanks, for, though, for registering so you could participate uh, if you did it for my stream or otherwise. It's pretty cool. All right, so then we're going to say people first. Um, I'll show you the importees. Organization, I guess. Right? Palm. CD. All right, so we're still going to take a file, but here's the funny business, and I have 20 minutes before my meeting with Mary. I can go to about five minutes before the hour, though. I do just want to have a little bit of a, a window in between. So the tricky part is I now have to deal with three different entities, so three different index page types and three different, as a result, three different uh, entities. So the ORM um, instances, the classes, these classes here. So somewhere up top when I'm iterating over the the rows before I grab the index page off, this will actually come into the, it'll look something like this. So I'll open the file and I will grab the rows out of the file, calling them authors. So Python is pretty cool that you, it's basically like writing pseudocode, but that, pseudocode that works. Now here's the point which will deviate. I'll need to determine the author type. And uh, add it to the correct place in the content hierarchy. <laughs> so my naive approach, and uh, Voimar thinks for the affirmation that I can just take a naive approach here, was to start right to left, since we know that these are, presumptively these are mutually exclusive, and if they're not, then we need, we have a data issue. Uh, meeting name, organization name, corrected family name, and given name, or given name and family name. Those are four different mutually exclusive branches of our logic here. So I can just make four um, if statements. Python doesn't have a case um, construct by design. They've thought about it. And they'd rather just use if else, which, OK, that's fine. And I need to do this explicit. So if the author is not none or something like that, if author conditions. We're going to check for three entity types, but for the person entity, there's two possibilities. We'll have some corrected metadata or just the generic split exploded string explodes. <laughs> through string exploded cases. I'm trouble talking. My tongue is getting tied and twisted. Pythonic way of doing this is not none, or what's hmm.
if name and okay, so Voimar says it. you can do if name and author that will check for the key if it exists. The key will exist because every row of our spreadsheet has that column. In other words, yeah, I guess just that we're iterating over the rows in Django or Python. In fact, is just saying created a dictionary out of each of these rows with these keys and these values. So it'll have an organization as none. So is that, uh, if I check for the key in the name, that is a nice and elegant solution, but the key is going to be in the name, but it'll have a value of none. So that's a little bit different, I think. Lamar, what do you think? Or will the in name in author approach work? I think it should just be, it's not none, right? And I'm assuming that they're going to be nuns. I don't really actually know that they'll be nuns. But is not, right? Well, there's one way to, of course, find this out. But, uh, through trial and error. Let me just make sure I don't make a typo on that. some really great help during the stream got me out of some really sticky spots that I just could not figure out <laughs> especially in JavaScript but also Python we're always learning there's no shame in that no shame in the game might be a little bit of premature optimization, so to speak, but to make this more real, uh, readable, I'm going to put these cases in variable names. statement this what I think about, uh, composite of four I can check for four conditions I don't know so if I do it like a tuple here Break this across rows. Where is it? Key. I got ten minutes till my meeting with Mary. I just want to get this loop to work, and that's going to be a good stopping point.
Uh, I have an else case that says, don't know what to do with this one. print debugging in a way. Okay, or should we give it a try? Kick the tires. less X. Oh, man. <laughs> I can convert it easily. We're not. Man, Boimar, you are a bastion of positivity and, and affirmation here. Thank you. I need to save this as that was Libre Office, yeah. <laughs> Save as, I suppose, right? Do I just need to type CSV? And detect it, I think. Will it? I'm going to quote all the text cells. And that was the thing we encountered, um, commas and author names, but no, I think we resolved that now. There's each row represents one author. There was just multi-author kind of funniness going on. All right. CSV ready and, ooh, man, that is fast. That is smoking. Everybody's a meeting though. So that is not correct. It's not working, is it? Everyone's a meeting. Perhaps it's an empty string because everything's quoted. Nice. Ready? Here we go. Let's try it again. Ooh, yeah. Perfect. Great stopping point. Five minutes to the hour. I may need to specify the separator. Yeah, that's a good point. The comma delimiter, though, seem to work as a default in the CSV dictionary reader. I think so. I mean, it seems to know every, mostly we're dealing with people here. So, yeah, I might be able to work on this a little bit more tonight. Probably not. I kind of want to just relax after my meeting with Mary. Might do some like music or something to unwind a little bit. Uh, by the way, Voimar, uh, are you a musician? And Imperium, if you're still around, are you a mu musician? If so, consider joining me for a jam sometime on ninbot.com. Ninjam is the name of the uh, software that lets you jam with people online. You've used Fruity Loops Studio before. Yeah, I was interested in Fruity Loops a while back. So that's a pretty cool one. Do you play any uh, physical instruments? In any case, um, this software called Ninjam, Ninbot is like a sort of a community of Ninjammers. Um, there's several um, clients for it. It's open source and they have different features, but you've got to just have something you can plug into your mic or uh, some kind of a software you can route internally. That's where it gets a little bit tricky. And they recommend just using Reaper. The people who create the Reaper Digital Audio Workstation also create Ninjam. And Reaper is really uh, sort of affordably priced as um, digital audio workstations go. It's like 60 euros, 
I'm a really big fan of our door just for what it's worth but also this Reaper is freely available during this COVID-19 so you just cut cut this or copy it to your clipboard and run Reaper for the first time and you have an evaluation license that goes till July that's pretty cool the man I just think for that reason alone, uh, it's really nice to recommend Reaper. But also, this Ninjam is so cool. There are people jamming right now, and uh, it works really well all around the world. So it's a great way to build community and uh, enjoy and unwind, enjoy yourself, unwind uh, during these otherwise somewhat stressful times. I'm running K Ubuntu KDE, and uh, it's based on Ubuntu. It's been Ubuntu has been really stable. I've been running Ubuntu over 10 years now, I think since like 2007 or something like that and definitely have had problems I'm not saying that uh, it's been a total walk in the park but increasingly stable but even so in the last year I've had um, a problem with my bootloader that was um, not for the faint of heart I'd rely on stack overflow on my phone to resolve it but the answer was out there the lesson I was reminded is just wait before upgrading till the patch release comes out after a major release so if they release for example ubuntu 19.10 wait for 19.10.01 19.10.1 to come out uh, because there's some things that slip through those release cracks and that's not even unique to ubuntu that happens with mac and windows alike so uh, i get eager to try the latest and greatest ubuntu has been really great user experience really stable um, great community and I think increasingly Ubuntu and GNOME are kind of converging their efforts. So it's not so much a bifurcation or factionalization in the Linux um, windowing system layer. I don't even know. Kubuntu is much more than just a window manager. KDE is it, at least, I mean. Is that a weasel? Yeah, the um, it's an ermine, I guess. The kind of running uh it's not really a joke but all of the ubuntu releases are named after an a animal and they do so in alphabetical order and so they have to find an animal for each release that fits the, the starts with the first letter of the current alphabet and uh not repeated one so if you look m more information here at the ubuntu releases um you can see the latest one starts with an e Bionic Beaver, they release every six months. Maybe they skipped a letter, but uh, these are the LTS versions. Um, here's the uh, all of the releases every six months. So 10 is an October release, 4 is an April release, 17 is a year, 2017, 2018. Um, so yeah, you can see they, it's a sort of an adjective and an animal. Utopic Unicorn, Vivid Vervet, Wily Werewolf, Yakety Hack, <laughs> Zesty Zappas, Artful Ardberg, Cosmic Cuddlefish. I mean, you gotta love it. That's pretty cool. So, I don't even know. Yes, let's see, education right there. What is a Zappas? It's a genus of North American jumping mouse. The only genus whose members have the dental formula. 1.0.1.3 over 1.0.0.3. Interesting. Okay, I really gotta go. Oh, it's 8 o'clock right now. Buster sounds much worse or stretch. Yeah, and some of these, uh, there's also Debian. Ubuntu is based on Debian SID, which is the unstable version. Now, the Debian <laughs> uh, code names come from Toy Story. <laughs> it's a fun fact, I guess. So Squeeze, Wheezy, Jesse, and Stretch, these all come from Debian, uh, from Toy Story, excuse me, um, the movie. And this, the unstable release is called Sid, because Sid was the kid next door that was mean to all his toys. I don't know if it mentions the history here. Yeah, you got Sarge and Woody and Potato and Slink and Ham. So yeah, kind of fun, fun with names. Oh, yeah, you were referring to the Debian name. Okay, but thank you. I really got to hop off so I can meet with Mary. I'm running a little bit late. Voimar, it's been nice hanging out. All your Debian news are cool. Um, I hope to see you in the stream. I'll try to be streaming tomorrow around 5 o'clock 
Eastern Europe time. Uh, actually, I won't be able to do it tomorrow. No, no, Friday. Around 5 o'clock Eastern Europe time, EET. So I hope to see you again. Thanks. Thanks for all the participation. And uh, Imperium, it's good seeing you around. Hope to see you again. This has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding hangout. A really great chat. Thanks to all the participants today. I'll try to um, improve the interactivity, um, interactive features on the stream, get the chat more prominently displayed or displayed at all on the video, for example, and take the uh, suggestions into account to get emojis. If you want to get involved with any open source projects, do stop by CodeBuddies.org. There's a lot of great activities going on, including the uh, CodeBuddies platform being rewritten from scratch on the back end with Django and on the front end with React. We've got tasks that are great for newcomers and really friendly mentors to help you along your coding path. Everybody is a teacher and mentor in CodeBuddies community. Thanks again for hanging out and have a great day or night and stay well.